everyone, this is Tom Moore, better known to most of you as Purple Pain from VikeFans.com, and I'd like to welcome former Viking offensive lineman Todd Kalis to the broadcast. Todd, thanks for joining us today, and how are you? Great, great. Glad to be here. Good. Listen, Todd, you retired from the NFL in 1995, and since then you've been an author, a sportscaster, and current president of the Pittsburgh chapter of the NFL alumni. Tell us a little bit about what you do as an NFL PA chapter president, and how do the retired players interact in the Pittsburgh area? Well, the NFL alumni, uh, the Pittsburgh chapter of the NFL alumni, is really a, a group of guys who live in the area in fact, they don't even have to have been a uh, player of that specific team. It's just guys get together, they form a chapter, they uh, generate a couple, uh, I guess you would say, revenue-producing events throughout the year uh, to support our motto of caring for kids, and that's what we're all about. We lend our time, energy, and effort to raise money for kids' organizations. Okay, and is it a pretty active chapter? Uh, yes, it is, actually. Um, I've got a lot of guys that uh, you know played uh, either here uh, for the local team or guys that just moved back here or maybe went to college here and then just decided to come back here once their playing days were done in the NFL. Uh, it's great to kind of see the, the alumni and the fraternities, so to speak, continue to stay together. It is, it is. And even when we have a chapter meeting, you know, I mean, I think it's like any school or team that anybody's ever been a member of. There's some type of fraternal feel to it. Um, whether you played with them or were a teammate of theirs, uh, it really doesn't matter. You're just kind of part of the same group, and you have things in common, and it's just a lot of fun to get together, sit down, and, and talk. Pass block against them, do they? No, no, that's, uh, you know, as every decade goes by, we tend to feel it a little more, so we tend to just sit, sip a cup of coffee or whatever. Whatever uh, works for the time. Sounds like a better idea. Well, I know you were born in Minnesota, and then you grew up in Arizona mostly and lived in three cities during your NFL career. And after you concluded uh, your career in 1995, what made you choose Pittsburgh as your home? Well, actually, I moved here. Uh, once I, uh, When I left the Vikings, I actually came to Pittsburgh to play for the Steelers. And at that point in time, I had been traveling back and forth, uh, actually from Phoenix to Minnesota every off season and every season. And at that point in time, I decided to just make the move to the city I was going to play in. Ended up coming here uh, to play. Ended up moving here, expecting to play maybe three, four, five years or end my career here. And uh, by chance, I ended up breaking my ankle, putting a plate and seven screws uh, in it midway or three quarters way into the season. Came back the following year and ended up actually uh, signing a contract with the Bengals, which was a very close city to where I was living, and I just decided to stay here ever since. Was it a big shock to the system when you predominantly grew up in Arizona to spend your time for five or six years in Minnesota playing? No, not really. It was actually kind of a nice mix weather-wise because, you know, growing up in Minnesota, in Stillwater, and then actually I moved across the river uh, to Wisconsin for about a year, year and a half, just over the the Hudson Bridge there, um, and then ended up moving to Arizona when I was a ninth grader in high school. So I, I spent about 14, 15 years, you know, in Minnesota and then briefly in Wisconsin, lived in Arizona for about 15 years, and now I've been up here for maybe 15, 16, 17 years here in Pittsburgh. The nice thing about it was that I had, you know, the coldest winter in the country growing up in Minnesota. I moved to the hottest summer in the country in Arizona, and up here in Pittsburgh, it's kind of a mix. You don't get a real extreme of one or the other. And it was kind of nice, and I kind of looked forward to my kids having the ability to play you know, winter and summer sports, and that's really the way it worked out. I understand You know, when you came out of, of high school, you were actually heavily recruited both in football and tennis. Was there ever a debate on which sport you might pursue, and what difficulties does a 6'6", 290-pound guy have on the tennis court? Well, the difference was when I was in high school, I was 6'6", about 2'10 at that time. So uh, I was pretty fast. I was pretty quick. Uh, actually, as a junior um, at my high school in Phoenix, which is a very tennis-based city, in fact, we moved south to Arizona to actually run a tennis club. My parents ended up being part owners and managers of a tennis club. That's why we moved there, was to run the club. I just naturally ended up spending a lot of time on the court, Ended up playing fairly well. Uh, my junior year in high school, I played number one. Again, like I said, any southern city is usually pretty heavy in tennis, so I played well. 
uh, really considered playing it at the next level in college. I actually was talking to people already as, my, as a junior in the spring and the summer. Went into my senior year of football, had a great year, got an offer from Arizona State right there in town, um, ended up accepting the offer and making the choice at that point in time to move towards football versus tennis and just taking the athletic ability I've kind of built in tennis and kind of applied it to the football field, and that's kind of where it all started. Did you ever regret the decision or, or miss the fact that you didn't play competitive tennis at the next level? No, not at all. And I still love the game. I still love tennis. I love watching it. I grew up, you know, like in the core of the 70s, you know, with the, you know, with all the great tennis that went on in the, in the 70s. I still enjoy it. I still like to play it. But to be honest with you, I believe I probably was able to go much further at the professional level in football, taking my size and my athletic ability, you know, to the gridiron, you know, versus to the tennis court. I, I don't believe I probably could have made it as far um, even at a professional level, uh, maybe could have been a teaching pro at a club somewhere. But I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm very happy with what I did, the, the, the sport I chose, and the memories that I created from playing the game. Well, it's interesting, and maybe maybe this is the correlation you can help us understand. It. You mentioned the speed that you had, and probably you developed that in tennis. One of the things that we notice as we look back at the films of you, both in college and professional, <laughs> is you had a strong ability to be a pulling lineman, which is not something everybody can do. So, so how did how did the the speed that you gained from tennis play into you being able to kind of get out on the edge and be able to block for those type of plays? Well, you know what, that's, I've never thought about that, but that's an excellent question because if you think about tennis, tennis is a tremendous amount of footwork and balance. And that's what offensive line play is. It's footwork and balance. So for a guy to be able to kick off the line and to do a crossover or even to run sideways while I, you know, basically eyeing the linebacker, cornerback, DB, whoever it is I'm, you know, is my uh, assignment, um, all of those things, you know, moving you know, forward, backward, side to side, all those things I've built in tennis, I kind of, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, every other sport you play as you're growing up, if you end up playing football, all those other sports are just helping prepare you for football. And it's kind of, uh, it's kind of that way. Any other sport that I played, and I did play other sports too, but that just ended up being the one I focused on. And it was interesting how, you know, leverage and body position and, uh, footwork, again, is really the key to all those things. Yeah, obviously you ended up uh, choosing to go to Arizona State. Uh, while you were there, first of all, did you know when you went to Arizona State that you might want to pursue football as a career? And second of all, how did Arizona prepare you for the NFL? Or Arizona State, excuse me. Well, yeah, I'm glad you corrected that. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, uh, you know, and, I, and that's great because there's always a great rivalry between Arizona and Arizona State. Um, honestly, I, I, I really, at the time, um, was pulled aside. In fact, it goes back to my book, <clears throat> and it actually is the core to some of the things that I did. I actually had a teacher, a shop teacher, actually. It was auto class in high school in 10th grade, and uh, at that time I was already playing a lot of tennis, and I was actually playing a couple other sports, too, and... He pulled me aside. The teacher in my class was a baseball coach at the school for years, was never one of my coaches, but pulled me aside. We had a five- or ten-minute conversation, and that conversation kind of changed my thoughts on my uh, potential and to take it seriously. Uh, he basically just had a heart-to-heart -heart and said, I know you like all these other sports. Uh, I really think you should consider taking your athletic ability, you know, and following through on football. I think you have a chance. I think uh, at the next level you could play or even maybe get a scholarship. And that was kind of a short summary of the guidance that he gave me, uh, which was interesting for somebody to not, you know, be a friend or family member or tell me what I want to hear. This was a guy who said, hey, take this seriously. I'm not sure if you have. And from that point forward, that's when I started to think about the next level. But um, at that time, I really wasn't a big follower of even college football. I really wasn't even that familiar with Arizona State. But once everything kind of put itself in front of me and I kind of learned what I was being offered, you know, I started to take it seriously. And then once I got to Arizona State, I kind of saw the guys that were going on to the next level. After a year or two, I was like, I think I could play at that level. And then every year I was there, I just worked more and more to prepare to get ready. The thing about the Pac-10 was that the level of play at the Pac-10 
Um, there's definitely a difference when you jump to the NFL, but it's not a tremendous big jump. Um, you know, so most of your larger conferences, I think, around the country probably pro- provide better preparation for a player if they are going to play at the National Football League level because of the size, the speed, and the competition that you're facing every week has really prepared you for that next level. And obviously, you know, that potential that they said that they believed that you have, you actually tapped into it and reached it, and that brought you to the 88 draft by the Vikings uh, where they took you in the fourth round. Do you recall at that time what was the NFL draft process and how it might be different than today, uh, you know, prior to the explosion of the NFL combines? I'm not sure. You know, the combine um, is probably, I would assume, again, not having participated or actually personally uh you know, experience the most recent uh, combine. I would assume it's still pretty similar. I mean, there's less rounds today, which might mean there may be less players there, you know, so it may be a, le- a little less congested when you're, you're standing in line to get all your exams and go do all your tests. But I would assume it's probably somewhat a, a similar type of a process. And then as far as the draft itself, again, still some similarities, but it's interesting how it's grown in popularity and how it's really become a show and really become – an interest, you know, of the fans in the off season. It's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a. I guess it would be like the the initial start of the the next season because you know the last season's over. Whether you did well or you did bad, you know, now you can look forward and have a fresh look on who's coming in. And you know, the off season's a chess game, anyways, with free agency and the draft. And the whole key is how you're going to come out of camp and what kind of chemistry are you going to carry, you know, throughout the season. But you know, the draft, uh, I would assume, is fairly similar. Um, you know, and as far as the process with the players, you know, most, if not all, are probably, you know, still, you know, using an agent and, uh, you know, probably going through the same processes that I did, uh, but it's probably a little more refined, maybe more than, you know, say 25, you know, 25, 30 years ago. See, it's interesting because the draft itself has become a phenomenon with, you know, getting better ratings sometimes than, than an NBA championship would. And I think the beauty of it is, is whether, you know, if you're a fan, for example, Lion fans are, you know, hope springs eternal and, and they're undefeated at the time. So everybody feels good about their team that time of year. Yeah, it's exciting though. But I mean, and the exciting part is, and it's interesting, the reverse scenario, you know, worst, you know, worst record gets the first pick or, you know, you always see trades going on. But, you know, that team that had to go through that last season is looking for a spark. They're looking for something to get excited about. This could be the guy that could change the team or the chemistry of the team. And then, you know, it comes down to the general manager and the ownership and the the head coach making good decisions on, you know, who they keep, who they replace, and who's going to play. And, you know, injuries and health and all those things to play into it, especially later into the season. Before the Vikings actually took you, did you have any idea that they were interested? Did you have conversations with them or any private workout or something like that? No, actually, no, I didn't, not specifically. I mean, there were a couple teams um, that I uh, may have talked to over the phone or that were maybe talking to my agent at the time. Um, But it's interesting how, again, it it is such a, uh, there's a, a lot of, I guess as you get away from maybe the first or second round even, it's probably more, you know, best left. You know, who's who's best available at this point in time that's still on the board. You know, and it really comes down sometimes to, I think, their play um, on the field, at the school, and whatever conference they played. But sometimes it looks like they just look at athlete. What kind of an athlete is he? What kind of potential? I mean, it was interesting to see guys that, you know, on teams I was with that were drafted as defensive linemen, converted to offensive linemen, or, you know, guys that were taken just for their potential, even at that age, you know, 20, 21, 22 years old, and and having the ability to actually kind of morph into a new position and go on to have a career in the league. You mentioned it's a big difference for players, and at some point after rounds one or two, it becomes best player available. One of the things we noticed that it's pretty uncommon these days for someone who's drafted after the fifth or sixth round to actually make the team. In your opinion, for offensive linemen, what's the big talent difference between somebody who's a third or fourth rounder and somebody who's maybe a sixth or seventh rounder? Is there that big of a difference? I, you know, I don't know if it, there, there may be, you know, in specific uh, instances, you know, there could be actually a, a true physical difference. You know, you might just see somebody that was, um, you know, maybe overse- overlooked. Um, there's always sleepers. You know, I always think of Johnny Randall coming out, and, you know, as a free agent and coming into Minnesota as a small, fast guy who just had the biggest motor in town and, and never stopped and was just, 
you know, went on to have a great career. It's, so it's really hard to tell, you know, um, right place, right time, injuries. Um, there's probably a fine line between, you know, keeping the uh, eighth or ninth man on the old line. Most old lines keep eight or nine guys if they're a long snapper, you know, in there. Um, so it's just that one guy and getting a chance. You might have some real seasoned starters in there that have been there for a few years, and you're just trying to kind of crack the, the roster to, to make the team. And then, you know, if something happens, you know, you step in and you do the job, and, you know, you probably go on to a longer career yourself. So it's it's interesting. You know, there's just different circumstances. Um, it's really not a choice of the player. It's really a choice of the team, whether or not they feel you have enough, uh, you know, to, to bring to the table and that, in some cases, it's it's really it's really minute as far as the differences. In some cases, it's it's obvious. You know, there's a guy who's just drive blocking and pass blocking and and doing a great job, and you know he's a fifth, sixth, seventh rounder that they're going to keep him. You know, or they're going to practice squad him or do whatever they've got to do, and and uh, you know hope they can hang on to him. Being from a conference like the Pac-10, it does prepare you pretty well for the NFL. But what are the biggest adjustments for, specifically for an offensive lineman as he moves from college to the professional ranks? What's the big difference? Well, there's probably you know there's probably a couple. One of the biggest things is the system. Um, it's can you and how quickly can you absorb the system? Because making mistakes and making mistakes at any level, high school, college, professional, is a big deal. But the the um, I guess acceptance of a mistake at the NFL level in camp or in a mini camp there's a lot of pressure so you know it's a matter of uh, making the right decisions on, at the snap of a finger and doing it as quickly as possible but see there's a difference between learning a play on paper memorizing it knowing exactly who I should block and actually even if they're shifting and making changes that you're still able to know who you're supposed to be able to block. And uh, that's probably the biggest jump because some systems are similar to some college systems. Some are completely different. So you're completely learning the system. He might even be moved into a different position. Maybe now you're playing left side versus right side. That will make a difference. Uh, but then you've got really these seasoned guys. You know, you might be coming out of college at 22, 23 years old, and you're now going against a guy who's 30 years old, married, has a, you know, has maybe one or two kids. He's got a great rapport with all the rest of the guys on the line. And, you know, it's a matter of whether or not, you know, you're going to ask that guy for help or ask him a question and hope he gives you the right answer or are you going to study on your own and hopefully know the right answer. The, last, the other thing I was going to say is after you memorize the play, even if you know who to block, you still have to have the confidence in having ran that in practice and the timing of it. So there's, there's a number of different things that play into the success on the offensive line and whether or not you have enough time in those mini camps and camp, you know, to make the team and, and move on and, and become a member on the roster. And it's my understanding that you were actually drafted out of college really to be a tackle, uh, but you played both tackle and guard in college. Which of those two positions was the more natural position to you? Uh, without a doubt, playing tackle. Okay. <laughs> There's, only because of my height and, and my arm length. Um, in college, you know, I was uh, thought of as being, you know, the, the next tackle uh, at the time. I can't remember if I was playing left or right side, but when John Cooper came in to Arizona State, um, it was really kind of a, after Dill Rad Rogers left, basically they had a, an influx of tackles. They had more than they needed, and they didn't have enough guards. And I was actually, prior to my sophomore year at Arizona State, asked if I could bend my knees. The whole reason being is I'd be really tall for a guard. Um, the thing that was a benefit for me was speed, because at the time, back in the you know say mid '80s, you know the really big, heavy, oversized linemen kind of hadn't come into play yet. It was still kind of fast, quick, and uh, you know with uh, you know my friend of almost 30 years, Randall McDaniel, on the other side, you know playing with him. Uh, basically, you know we uh, we had a lot of fun there for those three years. Which is which is more difficult? Because you mentioned, hey, sometimes they'll they'll move you from side to side. Is it harder to go from tackle to guard, or to be a guard on the right side and have to move to the left side and play? Which is the more difficult transition? Uh, well, for me, you know, even going back, um, 
I, I spoke about Arizona State, but I didn't talk about the NFL. When I did come into the Vikings, I actually did back up Tim Irwin and Gary Zimmerman my rookie year. And that's all I did. So we had three tackles, and I was the third guy. Todd Kalis, number 69, really a, a fascinating young man. And Terry and I had a chance to meet him back in preseason when he talked about being ambidextrous. Remember, he grew up in Minnesota and played ice hockey, and he could play it either left or right-handed. And he's just taken up golf, and he can't decide whether to become a left-handed golfer or a right-handed golfer. He reminded us of that story, didn't he? He said, say, I, I had warned my grandmother to listen for that story about my ambidextrous, but you guys didn't get it out. What happened? Well, we couldn't pronounce ambidextrous. <laughs> so, uh... A lot of pressure, and you never know in the NFL if you know somebody's going to go down with an injury, and you've got to be ready to jump in at any time and play. That's a lot of pressure. Uh, you wouldn't think it is. Maybe some people understand it is. But uh, so I went through the whole season that way, my rookie year, and then my second year. I think Terry Tausch had gone to the 49ers, and then me and Dave Huffman actually battled it out at right guard. Um, Randall had already started playing, and I think Dave Huffman was playing left guard at the time, and I think Randall, by the end of the season, might have already been playing or starting by my rookie year. I can't remember exactly, but we had a big battle in camp, and I ended up beating out Dave and ended up starting my second year and starting that entire season and the next year and the following year. Um, so it was kind of a matter of, for the team with the Vikings, they were set at tackle. You know, uh, my chance of becoming a starter was, was pretty limited, unless one of those guys retired or got hurt. I, I think the team said, who's our best five? And I think that's what they always say to themselves is, you know, if we've got guys at guard and tackle, it doesn't really sometimes matter height and size. You think about the Hogs with the Redskins. You know, they had some really gigantic guys playing guard, you know, way back before some of the teams started putting taller guys in at guard. So is one easier than the other, one harder than the other? In Arizona State, we use left and right-handed stances. So for me, it was natural for me to play left or right side. I just ended up staying on the right side the majority of my career and start to feel comfortable with it. Some guys have no problem. And, and I will admit, the left side is a little tough. And I'll tell you, taking that left tackle position is, you know, that blind side is, is tough because most teams put their fastest guy out there and, you know, they know, uh, you know the goal is to get to the quarterback. Yeah, it's probably be be a little frightening if you're the left tackle and, and then you realize in the huddle, wait a minute, you're putting the tight end on the right side? Wait a minute, what's going on here? <laughs> right, right, you don't have any help. <laughs> well, well, you know, the current Viking squad in 2013 has an interesting situation. Their uh, longtime defensive tackle, Kevin Williams, is on a one-year contract, and they drafted a guy high up in the first round named Sharif Floyd, who's his heir apparent. And, you know, you mentioned people like like Tim Irwin, who I think was you know 14 years in, in the position by the time you got there, do veteran leaders like that who see you as a potential person who could take their spot, are they helpful to you, or are they a bit standoffish to try to help you learn the position? Uh, you know, I can only talk from my experience. I mean, you know, it was really a matter of I don't know. You know, it's really that's that's a hard that's a hard question to answer. I can only speak from my own personal experience, but I did I did sense a great deal of that. You know, I kind of, uh, you know, there was a, a, a fairly, I would say, strong camaraderie, even with the senior guys on the team who had been there multiple years with the rookies. Now, I don't know, and I can't speak, actually, I can speak as a veteran. You know, when I was a five, six, seven-year veteran then of the league and these rookies were coming in, you could kind of see who, based on their size, their agility, their ability to master the system, the their rookie year or even into their second year, you can tell who might have it. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. You do, you, you go watch one-on-ones, you know, at, at camp, um, or you watch, you know, half-line drills or full-speed team or whatever it is. It's interesting how the ability or inability of a player to compete at that level surfaces. You could look at the Big Ten, the Pac-10. You could look at uh, maybe even high school, but you can, you can see who's able to function at that level and on a day-after-day day basis, you're looking at film, you're sitting there kind of watching the guy in front of you, you know, go against some of the, the best or, you know, maybe some of the not-so-good on the team. It's really how do they compete against the best on the team. That's, that's how you're always being evaluated. You know, when I go as a rookie and I'm going against Keith Millard one-on-one, -on -one, you know, in camp, day after day, they're evaluating that um, and trying to see, hey, oh, you know, 
you're doing good against, you know, Keith Millard and Henry Thomas and, you know, whoever else they line up. I don't care who you line up against me. That surfaces, they're like, we, this is a guy we got to keep. Mm-hmm. And you could get a senior guy who maybe got injured. Maybe he's getting old or towards the end of his career. He just might not be able to keep up. He just may not have the strength or the drive or whatever it is to make the team that year. And as much as the, the coaches or who, anybody who's built friendships with him don't want to see him leave, there's a time. You know, you can only play this game for a certain period of time, and it's different for everybody. You know, earlier we talked about your ability to be a pulling guard, which, frankly, you don't see as much in the NFL anymore. And one of the games we specifically looked at for you where you were pretty much dominant in the game was a 1993 game against Green Bay uh, in, Wisconsin, in uh, Milwaukee. And it literally, they seem to use this play over and over again as you, as you block for Scotty Graham. And, you know, when you have that, what are the skills you have to learn to become a pulling guard? And also, what are the risks of pulling your guard? I mean, do you leave something exposed? Well, you don't really leave something exposed. I mean, there's always a way to cover, um, you know, if I'm exiting the line, you know, the tackle or the center is somehow covering that. Or they might even pull a fullback in there, you know, just to kind of fill the hole to make sure nobody has any crack to be able to get through there to chase it. But, uh, you know, as far as it goes back, actually probably more so to college and, and all the repetitions that we had in practice, all the repetitions we had in games preparing, um, you know, for the next level, which was the NFL. And having coaches who had an ability to educate you on technique. Technique is tremendously important, especially for an offensive lineman. In fact, I don't know, but I think there's been a statement that, you know, offensive linemen, they basically all, they have to know the entire book or offense as as much or, you know, similar as far as the inside as, as a quarterback. So it's a matter of being able to, you know, back off the line. There's, there's a couple ways you can turn and run and pull. Uh, typically if you're doing that, you're probably, been given an assignment where you're going to turn, pull, and you're just going to take anybody that comes in front of you, or you're going to back away from the line with your shoulders parallel to the line because the entire time you're running sideways, you're actually looking at the guy that you're going to block. I remember a a number of times uh, over a course of years against the Bears with Mike Singletary and having to pull and actually look for those eyes and look for his number and basically not let him hide behind somebody, find him, you know, make it, make an opening and, and allow, you know, the running back to take off, you know, from behind me. So, and we were doing that, you know, left and right. Um, so it's really a matter of practice, repetition, and confidence in your ability to pull. Um, and then once you're out there, you know, your willingness to basically lay it on the line for the guy behind you to make an extra yard. And during your NFL career, whether it be with the Vikings, the Steelers, or the Bengals, what was the most difficult blocking assignment you had, and why? Well, I don't know. That's 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 hard to say because whether it was pass protection or a run block, sometimes it was difficult if you had a guy that had a lot of lead. I mean, and I mean, he was a heavy, strong guy like a Reggie White. Okay, mm-hmm. and I'm lined up head to head with Reggie. And I'm given the assignment to drive block him one on one off the line of scrimmage. You know that's that's a tough job. You know when you're, you know, you may be, and maybe, and I'll be honest with you. You know, I think guys somewhat, even though you you don't want to admit to it. You know, as a rookie or first year or second year guy, if you're going against a ten year Pro Bowl guy as a you know a rookie or a first year guy, you just do your job and, and you know hope everything falls into place. But I don't, you know, there might be a little of intimidation. You know, there, there's definitely some intimidation that goes on out there on the, on the football field. Um, that's difficult. To drive a guy off the ball by yourself, that's just, you know, two guys in a phone booth, one's going to come out. You know, that kind of a deal. And you're doing it over and over and over. Say it again on pass pro. You know, I'm, I'm setting up, I'm giving a little ground, and I'm trying to, you know, maintain my balance because the whole goal of the D-line is get me off balance, make a move, and get to the quarterback and try to do that all day. And uh, luckily I did have a, re- I had a very good day against Reggie White up there. And that was obvious, too. And then sometimes it was it was not only when you helped in double team, I mean, single team you had him a couple times. Well, what I was happy about is I had just come off a full knee the year prior to that. And, uh, you know, the goal was to come back from the knee. You know, I blew my knee against the Redskins in preseason, in 92 and was out the whole year so 
So that whole year of 93 was a year to come back and prove that one, you know, I could play at the same level. Uh, I did previous to being injured or hopefully even maybe a little better uh, just with age or, you know, experience or whatever you want to define it as and play with a knee brace and play, you know, with confidence. And uh, I was just kind of happy how that season came together for me. Well, it probably was was helpful somewhat that uh, you didn't draw the Packers and Reggie White in September. You got them in November instead to get your feet back under you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. That did. It did help. 